I see a few people I don't know, and you probably don't know me. My name is Don Ottenhoff. I'm the director of the Collegeville Institute. Glad you're with us today for this afternoon's lecture. Patty? <laughs> In a frontline television episode titled Growing Up Digital, anybody see this, Growing Up Digital? which examined the impact of growing up in a world already defined by the internet, video games, and social media, one of the scholars interviewed remarked that we have entered a time in which what it means to be human is changing rapidly. Now that's certainly a bracing statement, and if for no other reason provides grounds for theologians to take recent technological developments very seriously. I don't see, for example, how a contemporary theological anthropology could fail to take into consideration the interactions between humans and new technological devices. Any theological anthropology that doesn't cover that ground is not a sufficient anth theological anthropology for our time. But as it turns out, literary figures, especially writers of fiction, and especially a genre I don't know that very much about, science fiction, have been far ahead of theologians in thinking deeply about our technological situation. Karl Chopik, for example, a Czech polymath at the first half of the 20th century, wrote a play titled R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robot, or in Czech, a roboty. And he coined the term robot in that play, R.U.R. stands for Rossum's Universal Robots, and the play introduced a world to a factory that makes artificial humans, artificial humans, who end up rebelling against their makers. A very interesting play. Uh, more recently, Philip K. Dick, all of you have seen probably Blade Runners, which is based on Dick's um, short story, Do Androids Dream of Electric, electric Sheep? Um, so recently, Philip K. Dick and perhaps most searchingly Polish author Stanislaw Lem have probed the implications of new technology for what it means to be human. I now know at least something of another author who has delved into these mat matters, Margaret Atwood, because I have the privilege to have learned about Atwood from our speaker for this afternoon, Doc Dr. Anthony Segrist. Dr. Segrist has served as Associate Professor of Christian Theology at Prairie Bible College near Calgary in Alberta, Canada, and is co-editor of three books, Bonhoeffer, The Assassin, question mark, Challenging a Myth, Recovering His Call to Peacemaking, another book titled Participating Witness in the Anabaptist Theology of Believers, Baptism, and the Sacramental Character of the Church, and the third book, Power and Practices, Engaging the Work of John Howard Yoder. Uh, Anthony is here this semester at the Collegeville Institute with his family, Sarah, and children, Amos, Elias, and Isaac. Am I right? Did I get that right? Um, Anthony's talk this afternoon is titled Technoculture and Transcendence, a Theological Exploration of Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam Trilogy. Please welcome Anthony Segrist. Thanks, Don. And let me begin just by saying thanks, uh, by extension, to um, the rest of the folks at the Collegeville Institute and the School of Theology today. Um, what a, um, well, an experience of hospitality uh, those of us that have participated at the Institute have uh, experienced over the last few months. Uh, really, it's been a wonderful time and a great place to think across discipli disciplinary lines and to think about um, constructing books, writing, and, and it really has been uh, quite nice, quite nice. A little bit of background, um, <clears throat> just, just to, uh, to myself, I, I began thinking about doctoral studies in theology uh, with the concern of nationalism on the forefront of my mind. Um, and, and as I explored that topic, um, I began to see the importance of Christian baptism. Um, and 
then what, what I think um, sort of hit me pretty directly is that um, for, for the broader church today, in sort of ecumenical context, um, baptism is sort of incoherent. Uh, and so we're not really in a place um, to, to address something like nationalism very well when our own practices of um, inclusion, practices of assimilation, uh, are so fragmented. And so that was a lot of my, my early work. Um, and then for the last seven, eight years, I've been teaching theology in um, an undergraduate context. And an essay that I've used a few times is by Stanley Hauerwas, and um, he uses uh, Adams, Adams' uh, Watership Down, um, as a way to explore theological ethics and the importance of character, narrative, stories. Uh, and so I take that as a little bit of um, an example, but because I've seen the way in which students have found that um, mode of doing theology so engaging. I'm kind of doing an old school presentation today. I have a paper and I'm going to read it. And there will be no pictures. <laughs> and um, it, that's partly because I don't think I'm talking to any undergraduates. And so I'm putting a little bit of faith in this idea that there are digital natives and uh, most of you are not them. Um, so I, I trust that you can, uh, can, can follow me um, without that this afternoon. Let me begin with a couple of um, brief quotations in epigraph. The first comes from Atwood's uh, book, Oryx and Crake. It's a conversation between two characters, Jimmy and Glenn. Begins. As a species, we're doomed by hope, then. You could call it hope, that, or desperation. But we're doomed without hope as well, said Jimmy. Only as individuals, said Crake cheerfully. Well, it sucks. Jimmy, grow. Here's Soren Kierkegaard for self-examination. But imagine Luther, in our own generation, aware of our condition. Do you not think he would say, as he says in a sermon, the world is like a drunken peasant. If you help him up on one side of the horse, he falls off on the other side. <laughs> the topic of conversation that I would like to put before us today is the moral status of modern technology. Specifically, the sorts of technologies that make their way into our everyday lives those tools that shape the social space and mediate our relationship with the world. So I've divided my paper into four parts. First, I want to establish a, a context for this discussion. Secondly, I want to introduce Margaret Atwood's work as a key resource for this discussion. Third, I want to engage some of the elements in the setup of her novels that I think are relevant to our discernment, our discussion of technology. And fourth, I want to attempt to establish a sort of trajectory of discernment through the focal Christian practice of worship. Um, as you might have noticed in, in my comments about uh, some of my doctoral research on baptism, I'm, I'm quite convinced that um, much of our work in Christian ethics has been sort of overly conceptual. Um, and I think there are practices that can um, be, be far more helpful uh, in, in our um, attempt to live as people of virtue. So this is another um, stream of thought in that same vein. Part one, constitutions, fables, and pastoral timeliness. I would like to begin with a nod to our Roman Catholic context. On this campus and on other Catholic, Catholic campuses around the world, we've been reflecting on the fact that Vatican II is now just about 50 years in our rearview mirror. Let me draw our attention to one of the significant documents produced by that council, Gaudium et Spes. To review just briefly, Gaudium et Spes, or the Pastoral Constitution on the Church, was promulgated in 1965. It begins this way, this is the opening line, famous line, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the men of this age, one would presume women too, um, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the followers of Christ. That's the first sentence of the first paragraph. Here's the first sentence of the second paragraph. Hence, the Second Vatican Council, having probed more profoundly into the mystery of the Church, now addresses itself without hesitation, not only to the sons of the Church and to all who invoke the name of Christ, but to the whole of humanity. The posture of the pastoral constitution is one of solidarity. 
something akin to the Clintonian, I feel your pain sentiment. The intent of this document is to bring down barriers between those who are churched and those who are not, to say that the Roman Catholic Church experiences the same hopes and anxieties as does everyone else. What's fascinating, then, is how the document understands these hopes and anxieties. Of particular importance today is what Gaudium et Spes assumes about technology and the role of human work in our natural environment. In a word, it's optimistic. Consider the opening line from the first chapter of part one. It's under the title, The Dignity of the Human Person. Here's the line. According to the almost unanimous opinion of believers and unbelievers alike, all things on earth should be related to man as their center and their crown. Or consider these opening lines from chapter 3. The heading here is man's activity throughout the world. It's chapter 3 of part 1. Through his labors and his native endowments, man has ceaselessly striven to better his life. Today, however, especially with the help of science and technology, he has extended his mastery over nearly the whole of nature and continues to do so. Thanks to increased opportunities for many kinds of social contact among nations, the human family is gradually recognizing that it comprises a single world community and is making itself so. Optimism is probably the most important descriptor, but another might be anthropocentric. That is, it assumes virtually everyone in the world holds an anthropocentric cosmology. The examples I just read are features of the Constitution's cultural analysis. More challenging, it seems to me, are statements with greater theological weight, like this one, under the heading, Some Principles for the Proper Development of Human Culture. This is from the Special Problems section of the document. So consider this. When man develops the earth by the work of his hands or with the aid of technology in order that it might bear fruit and become a dwelling worthy of the whole human family, and when he consciously takes part in the life of social groups, he carries out the design of God manifest at the beginning of time, that he should subdue the earth, perfect creation, and develop himself. It seems to me that an important quality of pastoral intelligence is timeliness. So, any sense of discomfort, my own included, arising from such quotations, isn't necessarily an indictment of the appropriateness of um, this document in its mid-20th century setting. My concern, though, is how these assumptions play today. Here's what I think. The assumption that human creatures represent the center and crown of everything on Earth, the idea that extending human mastery over nature through science and technology will contribute to global unity, both of these ideas tastes increasingly sour in the modern world. Our modern world may be the way to say that. The notion that through work and technology and the subduing of the earth, creation is perfected and the world finally made worthy of human habitation, this optimism too is curdled. Well, what marks this change? We can point to a number of things, but I think the most appropriate um, place to look is Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. It was published in 1962. And since then, the body of related literature has unfurled, like rhubarb, maybe, in spring, marking a cultural shift in the Anglophone world, especially. Let me read a few lines from Carson's opening chapter. and She titles it, A Fable of Tomorrow. Here's what she writes. Then a strange blight crept over the area, and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens. The cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. No witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in this stricken world. The people had done it to themselves. It's a fable. But of course, no, it isn't. Carson says that what she describes isn't the future, but the present. The rest of her book is an attempt at a data-driven expansion of this claim that she makes in the first chapter. So Carson sounds an alarm in 1962. And her work is a, an initial swell in a sea change that seems to me anachronizes key points of the cultural analysis of Gaudium et Spes. Part two, assigned reading for the next council, a suggestion. 
In the rest of our time this afternoon, I want to draw our attention to a series of books that I think can be read as an elaboration on Carson's fable. I'm thinking of the three novels that make up Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy. Margaret Atwood is a contemporary Canadian author. Her work is known not just for selling well, but for its critical feminist edge and its relationship to her scholarly background in literary criticism. One of her early books is entitled Survival, a thematic guide to Canadian literature. And it did quite a bit to discover, to further a conversation about Canadian identity and Canadian literary culture. Her novel, A Handmaid's Tale, published in 1985, won the Governor General's Award and was a finalist for the Booker Prize. She later won the Booker Prize with another novel. It explores the place of women under theocratic regimes, and it's a thinly veiled critique of conservative Christian politics in the 1980s. The introductory section of Gaudi Metzpes says that, quote, the church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel. The suggestion I'm making here is that Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, which includes three novels, the first one, Works and Crape, the second one, The Year of the Flood, and the third one, Mad Adam, is a good place to start. They're published over a decade, from 2003 to 2013. And this subset of Atwood's work gives us a keen sense of the existential state of the early decades of the 21st century. We feel a nihilism resulting from a fading hope in technological progress. We feel anxiety stemming from an accelerating environmental crisis. And we feel a, a sublimated um, revulsion or ick factor that comes from the production of modern food. If Christian communities are going to express solidarity with the culture in which they are immersed, Atwood gives us a sense of what we're in for. Notice how I put that. It gives us a sense of what we're in for. In an interview in 1980, Atwood stated that one of the things that frustrated her as deeply as anything else was the idea that art is fundamentally self-expression. She actually said that she wanted to squish that idea like a pesky bug in her house. For Atwood, art isn't about exhibiting oneself, to the world, rather art, in her words, must say something about the world at large. And Atwood's ongoing involvement in public life leads me to believe that her view hasn't changed very much. What this means is that when we read the Mad Adam trilogy, we're in for a statement, a narrative statement, of course, but a statement about our world nonetheless. But that's maybe a little bit but now, let me be a little bit more specific in how I want to read Margaret Atwood's work. I want to engage Atwood's novels as though she is a curator of modern artifacts, our tools of communication, our ways of bringing food to our table, our medical practices, even our educational methods. Maybe a better way to put it is that I want to engage these novels as though Atwood is an anthropologist presenting us with an ethnographic account of our own world. It might seem a little bit strange to read a novel this way, or a set of novels this way. After all, fiction usually reads very um, differently than does work coming from the social sciences. But I'm not sure that the distinction is quite as, as hard or glued as fast as it often seems. <coughs> Both the novelist and the anthropologist are writing culture, to steal the title of a book edited by the social theorist James Clifford. In the introduction to that collection of essays, Clifford admits that calling ethnographies fictions might, in his words, raise empiricist hackles. However, he noted that in textual theory, the term fiction no longer has the connotation that it is opposed to truth. Instead, the term suggests the partiality of cultural and historical truths. For Clifford, ethnographic writings can properly be called fictions in the sense of something being made or fashioned. The description of culture on a page is, after all, made up. It's an invention. It's not the thing itself. So my reading of, of Atwood's fiction is an attempt at turning Clifford's claim around. If the products of cultural studies can, in some sense, be thought of as fictions, then it seems eminently plausible that we might think of fiction as cultural study in its own right. So as a member of the, the culture she depicts, Atwood becomes, for her readers, an indigenous ethnographer. 
Her work is an anthropological description of a 21st century culture. Now, if you're looking for these novels in a bookstore, you'll find them in the science fiction section. This is both helpful and not. It's helpful in that it points out the fact that Atwood sets these stories in the future. They are dystopias, sometimes likened to George Orwell's 1984. The science fiction designation, though, is not helpful in that Atwood herself overtly rejects it. She does so because her novels don't involve travel through outer space, encounters with aliens, or anything else radically discontinuous from our own world. So she pre prefers the designation speculative fiction. Everything she describes is either possible with existing technology now, or at least understood in theory. So in Atwood's world, it's possible to grow human organs in a swine host. New species are created, like biobams and raccoons. <laughs> the, um, the former was, in, in her world again, is created by a religious cult trying to force the lion and the lamb to lie down together to bring in the end of the age. Since they don't naturally do that, they just create a new species. The latter, the raccoons, were created by researchers trying to create new pets in their spare time, taking the best of raccoons and skunks. In places, this type of thing seems a bit silly. And Atwood might, I worry, be stressing the tethers of uh, our suspended disbelief. But the point that we shouldn't miss is that setting these stories in the near future serves two purposes. First, it gives us cultural distance, critical cultural distance, from what she's describing. She can make our world just strange enough so that we can see it in new ways. Second, it allows her to heighten certain contemporary trends by extending social and scientific trajectories into the future. For example, probably heard of chickens bred so exclusively for breast meat that they can't walk. Atwood's um, meat yielding birds are a few steps ahead. That was a little bit of a joke. Chickens couldn't walk. <laughs> <laughs> Which wouldn't be hard because the former can't. Anyway, they're simply grown to maturity in individual tubes. They have no beaks, no eyes, no legs, just a hole for nutrients to be dumped in sort of like a sea anemone or a, or a hookworm with lots of protein-rich muscle tissue. And they're marketed as chicky knots. Extensions of current trends like these amplify the tendency of modern culture to think about means and mostly ignore ends. The 20th century social critic and theologian Jacques Ellul refers to this complex of technological tools and technical thinking as technique. And Atwood's novels capture a growing discomfort with technique. Here's part three. Apocalypse then, now, in the future. Snowman wakes before dawn. Oryx and Crate, the first novel of Atwood's trilogy, opens with this brisk reference to time. Time before clocks or sundials, paleolithic time maybe. Out of habit, Snowman, the book's protagonist, looks at his watch. Zero hour. The watch doesn't work. And this fact triggers in him a jolt of terror. Time, the unfolding of history, has been reset. In the Mad Adam trilogy, this is accomplished through a global pandemic. A highly communicable disease was created by a researcher, codenamed Crake, and spread by his nubile assistant, Oryx. She handed out the virus in pills said to be trials of a new drug to enhance the sexual experience. Snowman, formerly one of their companions, has survived the purge. In the book's opening, he observes the shrieks of the birds in the distant ocean grinding against the ersatz reef of rusted car parts and jumbled bricks and assorted rubble sound almost like holiday traffic. But there is no more holiday traffic. The world has been pitched back into a wild era. Humans once shaped the Earth's biosphere, and now their activity has been brought to a halt. It's the end of the Anthropocene. Oryx and Craig, that is the novel, closes with the line, zero hour, snowman thinks, time to go. 
The story is a judgment of the late modern period suspended timelessly after this self-caused cultural implosion. In between these two references to zero hour, Snowman's post-apocalyptic journey commences. Through his rather choppy self-reflection, we also learn about his past. Martin Heidegger suggests that we're chained to technology in the worst possible way, those are his words, if we think of it as something neutral. Thus, in a famous essay called The Question Concerning Technology, he attempts to uncover its essence, which he describes as in framing. It frames our experience and frames our view of the world. Heidegger's work on the topic and that of Jacques Ellul might serve as examples, very different from each other, but examples for a perspective on technology that views it as substantive. That is, technology has ontological status and it does something to us. That's what I think corroborates this view. The narrative of Jimmy's coming, at, of, of Jimmy's coming to age exposes the half-truth of an alternative perspective. That is, the instrumental view where technology is understood simply as a set of tools wielded by persons at will. Jimmy becomes Snowman. In the Mad Adam trilogy, modern tools are not just things we use, but things that frame our view of the world. What I would can do as a novelist, thinkers like Heidegger and Elul cannot, sorry, what I would can do as, as, as a novelist, that thinkers like Heidegger and Elul cannot, or at least have a harder time doing, is display the way this works in um, lives as they're lived, as they unfold biographically. Through narrative, she can show what technology does to us and how individual choices do and don't remain important. Furthermore, what a novelist can do quite well is display this in relationship to growth in virtue or growth in vice. So we learn that the mythically named Snowman and Crake were once Jimmy and Glenn, two friends formed in large part by a cocoon life in a gated community where their desire to explore is mostly channeled online. As boys, they would play online games and watch pornography. Sometimes they would watch public executions on sites like headsoff.com, which, um, which played live coverage of executions in Asia. Alibubu.com, which uh, with various supposed thieves having their hands cut off and adulterers and lipstick wearers being stoned to death by howling crowds. The boys weren't convinced that these shows were real. And they liked the American capital punishment shows even more. They had sportscaster commentary, relevant facts and photos, along with applicable commercial advertisements. Atwood writes, shortcircuit.com, brainfrizz.com, and deathrowlive.com were the best. They showed electrocutions and lethal injections. Once they'd made real-time coverage legal, the guys being executed had started hamming it up for the cameras. Sometimes the inmates even broke free from their restraints. But Glenn and Jimmy thought that that, too, was probably staged. It was hard to tell what was real. They also watched an assisted suicide site called nightynight.com. They switched back and forth between the different types of coverage so quickly that it became hard to tell what the difference was between pornography and executions. Later, at zero hour, Jimmy, snowman, wonders, when did the body first set out on its own adventures? After having ditched its old traveling companions, the mind and the soul, leaving them stranded in some damp sanctuary or stuffy lecture hall. It had dumped culture along with them, music and painting and poetry and plays. Sublimation, all of it, nothing but sublimation, according to the body. The alienation of the body, life as a spectator sport, these are components of Atwood's cultural description. Her description of various technologies itself is interesting. As I've already noted, the technology that she addresses first is that of timekeeping. This is important because there's nothing really universal about the way we conceive of time. And it's commonly noted that the mundane technology of the clock was one of the key mechanical developments creating our experience of the modern world. Despite its origin in monastic desire for regular prayer, the clock participates in the secularization of time. That time proceeds with regularity in quantifiable, universal units is something we mostly take for granted. In his book, A Secular Age, Charles Taylor, a Canadian like Atwood, this is something Canadians do, they always mention who the Canadians are. 
<laughs> uh, so Jarvis Taylor, a Canadian like Atwood, describes the implication of modern timekeeping this way. These are Taylor's words. We have constructed an environment in which we live a, uni a uniform, univocal, secular time, which we try to measure and control in order to get things done. The implication, Taylor observes, is that we experience time as a homogenized, steady, horizontal flow. In the modern world, there's no stretching or collapsing of time. There are no genuine holy days or weeks in which we participate in eternity. This generic, homogenous character of time is part of what Taylor describes as the imminent frame. And I take this to be a key descriptor of Atwood's world and as an important part of Taylor's understanding of modernity. The imminent frame, Taylor writes, is the constructed social space that takes everything to occur within the natural order. In the modern world, in the imminent frame, language and time function univocally. The imminent frame, then, is our way of experiencing and being in the world that makes it difficult to take God or any notion of the transcendent seriously. I think Taylor's work serves as something of a grammar for our reading of Atwood. We might wonder how it's possible to construct a narrative in such a way, in such a time. We could think counterfactually, of course, that univocality and uniformity of modern time, in keeping with the techn technical culture it engenders, make conflict within modernity impossible. Yet, we, along with Taylor, observe that this is certainly not true. Conflict is apparent enough, not just between the modern world and the pre-modern world, but within the modern world. And it's the case, Taylor says, that modern culture is not just a scene of struggle between belief and unbelief, those who believe in something transcendent and those who don't. Instead of two poles, Taylor says that we experience three. He describes them briefly. He says there are secular humanists, there are Neo-Nietzscheans, and there are those who acknowledge some good beyond life. Now, of course, his, his is a big book, and so he adds um, flesh to the bones of this typology. But I think these rough categories are helpful for our reading of the Mad Adam story. I remember my Greek instructor telling us about laundry piles, or gender, as we were studying nouns. With Taylor's tripolar setting, secular humanists, Neo-Nietzscheans, and those who acknowledge some good beyond life, we have the beginnings of the piles, the laundry piles necessary to notice the deployments of human technical capacity within Atwood's trilogy. We can see how this participates in the conflict that provides its narrative energy and the narrative energy for our own world. Atwood's trilogy is made up, wait for it, wait for the surprise, of three volumes. Each volume explores a key group before and after the judgment of Zero Hour. The focus of each novel relates quite well with the contenders within modernity sketched by Charles Taylor. Let me explain how I see this. The first novel, Oryx and Craig, explores the lives of these two young men, which I've introduced us to, Jimmy and Glenn. They're part of the ruling class in Atwood's world. They live in all-inclusive, gated communities run by multinational corporations. They and their families are, are, are shuttled back and forth between these communities, rarely venturing into the anarchic cities or the uncontrolled plebe land. They have few first-hand experiences, other than getting high or having sex. Their world is a world of second-hand experiences, mediated by the web and the artificiality of hyper-controlled, built environments. They are, as the philosopher of technology Hans Jonas would put it, ensconced in the shell of thoroughly derivative artifacts. I'm borrowing this distinction between first- and second-hand experiences from the philosopher of um, psychological science, Edward Reed, and it's widely acknowledged that the ubiquity of modern technology reduces the former and enhances the latter. So reduces primary experiences and enhances secondary experiences. Jimmy will eventually graduate from a second-rate leftover liberal arts college and get a job in advertising. Rhetoric is the only um, tool from the liberal arts college that's really applicable in this world. Glenn, more scientifically adept, will attend a top-notch and extremely well-funded research institution and get a job in bioengineering. The trajectory of their lives, their attenuated eschatology, is toward self-assertion, extending their power through technological savvy. 
The companies they work for are kept in business by the fear of death or by the fear of death's cousin, aging. There's always a market for therapeutic and augmenting medical interventions. Jimmy's first job after college is working for a company called Anuyu. He took the job and began to, as he says, crank out the verbiage. Atwood describes his work this way. Cosmetic creams, workout equipment, jolt bars to build your muscle scape into a breathtaking marvel of sculpted granite, pills to make you fatter, thinner, hairier, balder, whiter, browner, blacker, yellower, sexier, and happier. It was his task to describe and extol, to present the vision of what oh so easily would come to be. Hope and fear, desire and revulsion, these were his stock and trade. So here we meet the Neonicians. Here technology is employed toward the well-being of those in power, even as it shapes their sense of what well-being means. The humanist goals of the Enlightenment are shucked off like all that entangles as the meaningless trappings of Christendom. For Taylor's Neo-Nietzscheans, aggression, gender difference, and hierarchy are rooted in our nature. Peace and justice are false goals. Glenn, who again later takes on the code name Craig, rightly sees that this can only lead to destruction. And he seeks to do just that. And then to repopulate the world with artificially engineered hominoids free of the design problems, as he calls them, of humans. And these folks are known throughout the trilogy as the Krakers, named after their creator. Crake lives in their mythology as a god. Now, the second volume is entitled The Year of the Flood. The story here is of a group, a religious sect, really, that lives in the plebe land. They're known as God's Gardeners. The gardeners move into abandoned buildings. They garden, they keep bees, they sell naturally derived products, honey, herbal remedies, things like that. The gardeners have a liturgical calendar, complete with feast days and saints. They celebrate Creation Day, the feast of all Adam and primates. There is, po there is Pollination Day, the celebration of Saint Rachel Carson and All Birds Day. <laughs> Joining Carson on the list of their saints are people like James Lovelock, E.F. Schumacher, Farley Mowat, Yoshi Lesham, Terry Fox, and Diane Fossey. Atwood includes gardener hymns in this volume, sermons from their leader Adam I. We learn that the gardeners anticipated a second Noahic flood. They prepared by stocking hidden air rats with non-perishable food and by learning to live off the land. As they understood it, their divinely ordained job was to protect flora and fauna species. Now, they're not afraid of death in the way that the other um, contestants in this world are. As one of them later reflects, vultures are our friends, the gardeners taught us. They purify the earth. They're God's necessary dark angels of body dissolution. Imagine how terrible it would be if there was no death. For the gardeners, one's passing enabled the continuation of the ecosystem. Advanced technology interrupts this. So here we meet Taylor's people who acknowledge some good beyond life. The gardeners resonate with the tenets of deep ecology, though not the immanentism of the Gaia hypothesis. For them, nature is creation. The world is enchanted, and it points mysteriously beyond itself. Or at least, it does so with respect to its origin. The gardeners are in a technologically addicted culture though not of it. They are not a genuine, viable, they're not, however, a genuine, viable alternative to this culture. None of them actually believe their own weak theology. At best, the gardeners are a pragmatic stopgap necessity. Whether they're God's gardeners or the devil's, it isn't clear that that matters, as long as they take care of the weak. The third and final novel bears the series titled Mad Adam. The core group here is known by that name. They're a splinter group. They broke away from the gods' gardeners. And unlike um, the gardeners, the Mad Adamites are willing to use force and to engage in bioresistance. For instance, they develop a, a bacteria that eats asphalt. They're the only ones who survive the pandemic as a group. Post-zero hour, the Mad Adamites are joined 
by a few ex-gardeners and a Quaker tribe. The Quakers embody the desire for innocent human culture, sacrificing human history for natural balance. The mad Adamites reject the lust for power with its attendant destructiveness of the neo nietzschean corporations. They're deeply skeptical of Gardner theology, with its transcendent willingness to sacrifice comfort in this life for the next. The mad Adamites are Taylor's secular humanists, who place the goal of life squarely within this life. They try to uphold the values of the Enlightenment without the grounding of Christendom. So while they find something like marriage useless, they value education. But we should notice that Atwood construes them as relatively powerless in the face of the money and the technical prowess of the corporations. If Orwell's 1984 expresses anxiety about the to totalitarian regime, Atwood's trilogy um, couches the oppressors as the superhuman corporation. Atwood's trilogy concludes with the wedding of an ex-gardener and the leader of the Mad Adamites. The Quakers learn to read and write, and they begin to record their own mythical history. Hybrid Quaker human children are born. Here, I think Atwood establishes the arc of a future for her characters. She's going a step beyond analysis and description. She offers a prescriptive suggestion, sort of uh, detente on two axes, between technology and nature, and between faith and science. And this places her near the position of Charles Taylor himself, who thinks that the practical primacy of life, his words, achieved in the Enlightenment can be held while rejecting the metaphysical primacy of life espoused by exclusive humanism. And this is anticipated throughout the novels by moments when Atwood's characters experience a sense of what Taylor calls fullness. Through nature, through relationships, through the presence of art, they have these fleeting senses that there's something beyond the math of mechanics. Like many late moderns, they're periodically haunted by the idea that the imminent frame itself is constructed. A construction instead of what's left over after, na after the naivety of faith has been outgrown. Actually, this isn't quite where Atwood's trilogy ends. A wedding, the reclamation of liberal learning, the discovery of the riches of hybridity are not quite the conclusion. Atwood is, on the one hand, too good a storyteller to wrap things up so neatly. On the other hand, or put differently, you'll remember that I described her as an ethnographer, as an indigenous ethnographer. So it seems to me that Atwood is a child of her time, and zero hour isn't the end of modern chronicity. Within the imminent frame, in fact, that's impossible to imagine. And so Atwood's world never actually escapes the universal aspirations of modern chronicity. The champions, the mad Adamites, the Quakers both, are irrepre irrepressible technologists. They're incapable of providing an alternative to a technologically addicted culture, and Atwood knows it. In the closing pages of Mad Adam, even the Quakers are schooled in the habits of technoculture. The closing deliberation is over whether the dead protagonist will um, take the form of an elderberry bush or of a bear. It's hollow. The narrator chooses the latter the bear because it's happiest. Truth is subsumed under something like entertainment, the current goal of so much technological innovation. The story bumps against the top of the imminent frame. There's no stars, only a ceiling. No hope, only sentimentality. The main character may live on, either as an elderberry bush or a bear. Who cares? It's the world of value, not the world of fact. Values don't increase the efficiency or the universalizability of tools. Facts do. <coughs> Meaning is manufactured, not discovered. So says the all-seeing technocratic eye. Final section, part four. Signs of the times. But which way should we turn? It's dangerous to long for zero hour, even though such longings are ancient. It's the longing of the maligned, the oppressed, the misunderstood. And under <coughs> technocratic rule, there's plenty of that to go around. There was a time, Albert Borgman tells us, when modern technological developments released us from age-old threats of hunger and disease, illiteracy, and general discomfort. Now, he observes, the general focus is leisure. 
Borgman writes, if we're committed to the further sophistication and expansion of the technological machinery of the industri in industrially advanced countries, it can only be for the sake of more numerous, varied, and refined consum consumption goods to be enjoyed in leisure. In a similar vein, there was a time, you little states, when technological development had to face the question of righteousness. Now, there's only the calculus of efficiency. So, Atwood's world longs for release from its oppressor. In the biblical world, apocalyptic uh, wishes were occasions for self-deception. Both the sheep and the goats are surprised in the story of the judgment that Jesus tells in the Gospels. Centuries earlier, the prophet Amos wrote about the same dynamic. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. As when a man frees from a lion and a bear meets him, or goes home and leans against the wall and a snake bites him, will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? The key pastoral lesson we learn from the Mad Adam trilogy is the sheer difficulty of finding ways to decenter technology from our corporate and personal lives. There's an anxiety of our day that grows every time gadgets fail to fulfill the promise of the good life. Every time electronic communication alienates, confuses, and destroys when we had hoped that it would connect. Atwood is a true indigenous ethnographer. Her, stories portray, her story portrays us as incapable of living in a different time. How different this is, the next council fathers might well note, from Paul's words in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, when he writes, there is a new creation, everything old has passed away, see everything has become new. And here, I think, is the church's mission amidst the signs of our times. The gardeners are a helpful point of reference here. Only they are able to claim the world as a gift, and in so doing to uncover their own vocation as caretakers and gardeners. This love of creation and vocation as keepers of the garden unites science and faith. Their mutual care, transcendently motivated, enables them to rupture the technological system. Atwood rightly sees that the key to this is their worship. I noticed in some of the reviews that fans of, of action seem frustrated by the numerous sermons and songs that she includes in her second novel. But maybe Atwood has observed something in Christian worship, like Baron von Ebesch, when he writes, the church as a political entity finds its constitutive and restitutive act in worship, which is the central praxis of the fellow citizens of the saints. Well, of course, Bon and Vetch, like the church and like the gardeners, is a limited and flawed figure. The very existence of an ecumenical council such as Vatican II is an admission of that. The gardeners are not ultimately successful. In fact, it's hard to tell if Atwood if that positions them as heroes or more cynically as foils, as sort of silly characters of faith. Gardeners fail, and here I think Atwood provides us with several more lessons. We notice, for instance, that their theology lacks an account of redemption. Christian theology, more properly, recognizes that creation and redemption are mutually defining teachings. And we can't appropriate, appropriately appreciate creation if we fail to recognize its, its inclusion in God's redemptive work. See, I am making all things new, the one on the throne says to the seer of Patmos in Revelation 21. But the definition works the other way as well. The need for redemption allows us to recognize that, as we often classically um, refer, creation is fallen. Nature is not innocent. Very much related is the fact that, the, that Gardner theology lacks an account of providence. Christians in the New Testament are void by hope. They believe the cosmos is open to the divine other in its origin, in its continuation, and in its future. They're confident that the powers that appear to rule are pretentious. They believe that the incarnate one is the Pantocrator. The gardeners fail to understand the full paradigmatic politics of worship. Their worship is preachy, pedantic, overly relevant. And this is a crucial deficit because in worship we find Christians using a most potent tool, speech. 
potent knowledge of speech. A pastoral, um, a pastoral response would do better by acknowledging the way in which liturgy, the people's work, provides a paradigm, a paradigm for the good life, and within that, human technical capacity. Here are a few examples of what I mean. I'll close with these examples. First, worship is paradigmatic in the way its theocentrism abruptly displaces hope and technological prog progress and destroys the anthropocentrism which underwrites the abuse of creation. It provides a matrix for accountability in the molding and making we undertake with the stuff of earth. Second, worship is paradigmatic in its bodiliness, having at its core the gathering and feeding of the community. And this not just noetically, not online, but physically. Third, worship is paradigmatic in the way it takes up and transforms the mundane. Washing becomes baptism, eating becomes communion. The everyday is charged with the light of eternity. Fourth, worship is paradigmatic too in its very workishness. The telos of modern technology seems to be the elimination of work. What? Wendell Berry asks in response, are people then for? Liturgy is work. Von Betch and others remind us that for ancient Christians, the offertory was the part of worship in which those who participated in the Eucharist were themselves the offering. There's no shortage today of, of cultural commentators pointing to the loss of work's dignity, particularly physically demanding work. I think here of some of the... Um, work by Matthew Crawford, who originally featured the Congo Higher Ed. Worship rightly interpreted might help us recover the dignity and goodness of work. Fifth and finally, worship is paradigmatic in the way it commends difficult tasks. In Christian worship, participants are not only forgiven, but sent out, tasked as it were with the commission of apprenticeship in the way of Jesus. And in this, there is not only the granting of a specific task, but the recognition that difficult tasks, particularly those that involve our whole selves, bodies included, are avenues of maturity and growth and virtue. Technology, then, must never eliminate the opportunity for such challenges, for in them lies the realization of the new creation. And I'll end there. Questions, questions, comments, yeah, let's talk. I'll start. The, you ended up with these um, paradigmatic aspects of worship. I wasn't clear about the relationship between those and the kind of worship that occurs in volume two with that community. Are any of these uh, representative of the kind of worship carried out in, in that community, or are they very different? I think they're very different. Okay. I, th I, I think they're very different. Um, worship there is, um, well, I've said it, it's, a higher, it, it's, it's really pragmatic. They come up with sort of holes in their worldview, and then worship is kind of where they stitch them together in the sermons. Um, uh, it's 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 not it's not physically engaging, um, and it's it's sort of overly relevant. Uh, so there's no speaking to things that are greater. Uh, and, and so, so I, I think it, it brings up a, an interesting sort of question about authorial intent here. Um, and if if you watch some of Atwood's interviews online, um, you'll see her commending this sort of role of being God's gardener, and, and she sort of likes. Um, Christians who are into ecology and into deep ecology. Um, but it's not clear to me, at least in the book, um, whether she's really on board with that or just sees them as a practical, um, you know, pragmatic um, sort of alliance. So it's worship within, within the eminent frame. In I think. And you're in the. Yes, the I, think it, I think it is. I think it is. Beyond that. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and so I, I think that's why the role of the, the gardeners is so ambiguous. Uh, because she tries to sort of point beyond the imminent frame, tries to um, have them as people that acknowledge this sort of transcendent good, but I don't think it's ultimately very convincing. I'm not sure that, um, 
that that's really seen as a viable um, mode of being. Mm -hmm. Does it ring true to you ethnographically as a portrait, I mean, as a stylized, fictionalized portrait yeah. of the North American church? Well, I think, I think it's extreme. Um, That's a question about the novel. Yeah. It's also a question yeah. about how you see the North American church and where the resources might be for, for making real the vision of worship that you want to kind of conclude with. No, I, I think her, her description of the church is. Um, has a room too ethnographically. Sadly, sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. It's sort of sentimentality. Um, Plug the holes in the, that you don't right. know. That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. Do sort of add up kind of a layer onto parts of our lives that we think should be more important than they seem to be, uh -huh. you know, marriage, death, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, and so they have these kind of these rituals that they sort of make up. Um, there's no real sense of sort of history or death there. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, sadly, I think it often is. But, um, I mean, I'm a Christian, I participate in the church, so I, uh -huh. I certainly think that there's a, um, um, a body of witness and ongoing practice there that um, doesn't line up at all um, with, with how she describes things. Have you had a copy of Worship at Work? No. Did, uh, did we give you a copy? <laughs> <laughs> What do, you, do you think the, the rule is any uh, can be applicable to uh, Margaret Atwood's theses? Oh, you're in a much better place to speak to that than I am. <laughs> um, but oh, I think profoundly so, profoundly so. Yeah. But particularly this key place that 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 um, work has, because um, I think Wendell Berry's observation or his question is a really good one. Um, what are humans for? Like if 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 work isn't somehow involved in the good life, um, we're, we're sort of seeking to just make ourselves obsolete. And uh, I think maybe the rule gives us a good way to, to think about the importance of the role of work. Do you think Toby is the figure that can push the God's gardeners into a more deeper understanding of the job? Because she lives that monastic life. Not voluntarily. Yeah. But she yeah. does live it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, oh, and she was sorry. highly critical of the rituals before, but then she sees that they're valuable to her. And and I like what um, shows up a few times, her questions about faith. What is faith? Mm -hmm. um, and um, Adam one encourages her to sort of practice and then sort of see what becomes of faith later on. And I think there's a real wisdom there. Um, but Again, I still I still think it ends up being with the imminent within the imminent frame. Um, I, I I don't think she ever really believes. Um, I, I, so I think it's kind of cut short. Um, and so so I, I think her own narrative trajectory runs up against sort of the metaphysics of the author or the metaphysics of our culture. That's just my reading. It totally comes to a different place in the third book, I think. How so? Explain what you think. Well. I mean, I, I, I'm not coming at this from a theological perspective as much as I am um, in thinking about the way the book's put together in, in, a, in a more philosophical and, and sense of thinking about what it, what it says about human nature. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I liked your connection to Charles Taylor, but I think there's also a, a sense in which rhetoric is a theme that threads mm -hmm. its way through each of these. And there's three different layers of rhetoric. I mean, there's the, there's the overt capitalistic rhetoric of the machine that Jimmy becomes a part of um, in the first book, but then there's also the rhetoric of that, um, the way you were describing the God's gardeners. There's a, there's a rhetoric in the, in the practice of God's gardener, too, which one might, um, I suppose, think about in terms of um, being a more veiled sort of rhetoric. It's, it's not overtly rhetorical, but there's a rhetorical, rhetorical element that's necessary in order to fill in those gaps and plug those holes. But you raised the, you mentioned witness a moment ago, and I think that's a wonderful way of thinking about um, the, the way in which rhetoric functions in the last book. Toby is very much interested in the stories of other people, and she wants to hear their stories, where they come from. And there's a sense in which she's honoring those stories and realizing that you know, sometimes the best you can do 
is plugging those gaps, and that's okay as long as you honor the humanity of the other person. And she really takes that on when she's um, engaging with the Quakers, right? And teaching them and seeing where that goes. And she has no idea. I mean, and that's the imperfection of, of, of human beings, right? So I, I, I think she is in a different place. I'm not sure how to frame it in terms of the question of worship. Do you, do, you, do you think she's more than a cynic in the end? Yeah. Like, like, does she just sort of end as, as, as a... I think she is. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know that she believes in the God's garden. She still follows and practices, and she's cynical about that. But that's a form of belief, but, isn't it? But, right? there's, like a, but there's another, I think there's a new layer. Like, there's a... She finds in herself the value of that for herself in a way that she didn't have before. She was doing it because Adam once said, keep practicing and then you'll find. I think in the end she finds something. It's not what he thought she would find. And it's not what she thought he thought she would find, right? Yeah. But it's something yeah. else and it's meaningful to her. And it and it gives her something yeah. to live for in a way. But to me that just kind of loops back where it's well, sort of her own kind of, this is what kind of makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's why I, I kind of, I, I feel like the book ends, um, more, I don't want to sound too dark, but more hopelessly. Um, you know, so we, we have these Quakers, and they're supposed to be in a, innocent, kind of um, you know, in tune with nature people, and then they learn to write, and you know, they, they develop mythology and develop this sort of cynicism about their own mythology. Um, so, it, yeah, I, 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 I really I like what you're saying about yeah. I suppose about that rhetoric and there's an inevitability to rhetoric. I guess. Sorry. So if I would say the first book is about um, the sort of overt rhetorical gimmicks and, and capitalistic or yeah. consumeristic yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the other is more sort of veiled rhetoric, the rhetoric we use to sort of soothe and salve mm -hmm. our existence. Um, the rhetoric of the third book is the inevitab inevitability of rhetoric. We always have yes. stories to tell. Yes. We always embellish a little bit. I mean, how much of the stories she was hearing were always, you know, you add a little bit, you leave a little bit out, she doesn't always reveal everything. And then the stories as the Quakers start to record their own stories are imperfect. So that sort of the inevitable imperfection of the storytelling, that yeah, that kind yeah. of rhetoric is to me a kind of there's an earnestness to that. Okay. While maybe hopeless still, or not filled with the kind of hope you would expect. I mean, that's Atwood, right? Yep. I mean, she's yep. never going to be ending on a hopeful note, is she? Yeah. So, well, it's Atwood, I think, is the 21st century. I mean, I would sort of hold her up as kind of uh, a representative figure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know yeah. if that oh, that's for, for the, that's the question of worship that others are addressing, but to me, in terms of rhetoric, the, what you were saying helped trigger a kind of uh -huh. Reflection on that. I was wondering uh, whether you uh, are in any way familiar with uh, Herbert uh, Dreyfus's book, All Things Shining, reading Western classics in order to find mind, meaning in life or something like that, who yeah. also discusses novels and uh, this case of nihilism. He discusses a it's, it's some years ago I read it, but, uh, about infinite jest. I don't know which, which the writer Foster is. Foster yeah. Foster Foster Foster. Foster. yeah, and then he discusses Melville. And yeah. I was just wondering yeah. whether you are. I, I mean, I, I, I think oh, um, certainly David Foster Wallace would be a really helpful figure to involve in this discussion. One of the reasons I like Atwood is because she's so accessible. Um, so many people read her stuff um, as compared to someone like David Foster Wallace. So, no, I'm not familiar with the book. Okay. I have a question related to that, and it's kind of a question that, uh, of aesthetics. I'm not sure what you gain by introducing this whole discussion of anthropology and eth ethnic ethnography. I, if I, as I listen to you, it seems to me you're trying to say to your reader or to your audience, there's truth here. 
she's just not making this up. And, and just before that, you quoted her saying, art is self-expression mm -hmm. is, is something she really doesn't like. Mm -hmm. But if you read a literary critic, a contemporary liter literary critic by the name of James Wood, he's a very well-known, highly regarded literary critic, and he says, all great novelists are noticers. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things they do really well. They notice, and what they notice, they write down. And I think if you, if you picked any great work of literature, pick your age, you know, whether it's David Foster Wallace, or, or you know, Trollope, or Jane Austen, or whatever, would you still run the same, and then, would you say of Jane Austen, she's a really good anthropologist or ethnographer of her period, or would you just say, she's a great novelist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's noticing things, and what she notices, she, she aesthetically draws together into this work of art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do you go there? You know, part of it is um, because I imagine myself speaking in a theological context, and so there's, um, I think, an appetite for things sociological to kind of ground theological discourse. Um, and so I suppose I'm trying to give the novels a little bit more credibility. Um, and um, yeah, that's, 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 that's probably why. And I, I, I agree with, yeah. with what you're saying, that it's not necessary. Okay. Yeah. Is that a trend you want to support as a theologian? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I do, actually. I think I do. I think I do. I think I do. I think I do. Yeah, I think, I think um, paying attention to um, social sciences is, is, is a sort of helpful therapy for contemporary theology. Okay. You don't? I'd rather pay attention to literature, I guess. Okay, as literature, not make it something else. Well, I believe, I do agree that, that every uh, worthwhile novel describes the world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a way that is grounded in, in something. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm kind of tired of, of trying to let the sociologists talk first and then I get to say something. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously, yeah, because yeah. they divide things up in a certain way, which may or may not be theologically mm -hmm. uh, helpful, mm -hmm. which may just embody some of the prejudices of our, of our culture that likes numbers better than it likes stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's yeah, all no, the that's, top of my that's, head. No, but, that's good. You know, that's good. That's I good. Mean, another that's way of good. asking the question is, what does Margaret Atwood give us? that Taylor does not. Do I need to, can I just read Taylor and get those um, points about um, these three laundry mm -hmm. piles and so forth and skip Atwood? Yeah, I don't think you can. I don't think you can. Or do I you need get something really valuable, but um, I, I, I think the way she explores the unfolding of individual lives is something that um, I just don't think Taylor can really match. Is he's concerned about sort of you know century after century after century, um, kind of giving us this big backstory to the construction of the imminent frame, um, and when we want to actually engage questions of technology in our own lives, I think we need we need to zoom in a little bit. I think I think we need the unfolding of the individual life. Isn't it that maybe you are um, um, you tend to uh, embrace this anthropological reading also because she doesn't really associate or like any of her characters better than, you know, there's not really a hero there that you would consider fully positive or, or someone. Yeah. So then yeah. you get this yeah. feeling of m more objectivity because she's not really uh, committed to any p particular perspective there, whereas if it was a novel where, where there's some kind of positive hero somehow um, that you would be willing more to go to literature. Mm -hmm. And you get this yeah, kind of fake feeling of, an, of objectivity. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I don't, I don't have a response to that. That's a, that's a good observation, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I suppose, I mean, that's part of what pushes me in this anthropological direction, because she, she's, I mean, as much as Toby is a hero and some of the others in other ways, um, the trilogy isn't just the story of their life and kind of their triumph or their ultimate defeat. Um, I think it's more broadly descriptive, as, as you're saying. And I think they're, therefore, potentially more helpful for our reflections on the place of technology in our lives. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you very much.